Hello, my name's Robin Hopper, and I just had to do one more Ansika. Uh, and I was, I'm so pleased that uh, the Ansika board planned uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade in my honor. Um, so I'd like you all tonight to go out and have a, have a drink from my friend, uh, Grass. Um, his nickname for me was Grass, and I think a childhood uh, um, nickname. He was a man of, of many hats. Uh, he started in England um, in theater and set design, and he was um, a travel guide. And I think that travel guide helped him with all with his career in that he spent uh, a lot of it traveling the world doing workshops. No, okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's me there. Um, he, he always was a man of theater, and so the, the, when he did these uh, workshops, he was always coming up with new t-shirts, new hats, new glasses, all that stuff, and, uh, and I think that was the theater background uh, coming out of him, and he would be very disappointed if, there was a, if he did a workshop and there was 20 people. Uh, I'd be excited. Uh, he, he, he needed 100, at least 100, or, to make him happy, and the more people, uh, the more theatrical he got. Um, he, he immigrated with his first wife, Sue, to Canada from England to teach at uh, Central Tech uh, High School. And that was in 1968, which was the year I graduated from high school. And, uh, in, and so in, that, in the 60s, early 70s, there was a, a proliferation of colleges in Ontario uh, to deal with all of the uh, the children of the baby boomers. So um, Robin was then offered a job at, at um, Georgian College, and he set up a, a studio uh, program there, which I, I became a, uh, a student there. And I'm proud to say that he taught mugs, jugs, teapots, and casseroles, and how to make a living as a potter. And for my graduating class of 10 people, nine of us went on to uh, raise families and um, build houses and homes and careers uh, with our hands, uh, making pots. And the tenth person, uh, she took a job and she's just recently retired and she's back making pots. So 100% success rate. Um, his first 10 years in, in uh, Ontario, Canada, which is cold like Pittsburgh, uh, he uh, made a lot of production work and um, uh, he was represented in galleries all across the, uh, the country, very prolific maker. Uh, and within 10 years of arriving in Canada, he'd received, he received the Sadie Bronfman Award, which was our biggest uh, craft award. Uh, and, and that was in 1978, I believe. And that was an award of $15,000. And $15,000 in 1978 was a lot of money. I, I mean, I bought my first house uh, at about that time for 27,000, so it was sizable, and, and it, but it also placed a demand on him to do sh uh, shows across the country. And um, so he, but, and he, he hated the winter. Snow was a four letter word. So he, he, he moved 3,000 miles to uh, Victoria, BC, where there's a, a moderate climate and he could do what he loved as much as his art, and that was gardening. Uh, so this is uh, some of the production work that, that he did. And with, with the production work, um, he, he, and being on the road doing all these uh, workshops and so on and so forth, uh, he was getting tired, and, and that took a toll on his life. And uh, consequently, uh, his marriage ended, and he joined up with um, uh, Judy Dial, who I think was a real uh, backbone in his furthering his career because she's an organizer, and he was the and he was a creative guy that wanted the show, but somebody had to dot the T's or dot the I's and, and cross the T's, and Judy did that. But she also suggested that he uh, start making one-off pots and stop doing uh, you know, 100 mugs every morning and so on and so forth. So when he started doing uh, more one-off work, I think that's when we really saw uh, 
the brilliance of his brushwork and the brilliance of his, uh, his glaze research. Because what he had done when he moved to BC was he started a, a program then, uh, there Judy and Robin started the Machoison School of the Arts and he would teach glaze classes. And most students were given projects of six, 700 glaze tests to be done by the end of the week. Well, guess who would benefit from all those, that research? So this is, a, this is a, some of the parabolic, parabolic bottles that he did, and I'm fortunate to have one at home, and I think they're a signature piece of his. You sort of see a reference there to uh, the Hans Koper uh, work, who's, who, whose work he loved. And because he was in British Columbia with the mountains and, and, and so on, he, his, he did a lot of uh, land, landscape um, uh, platters and, and vases and so on and so forth. Agate ware, he also um, uh, wedged different clays together and cut and faceted them. And these were all done in series. He would, he would move from series to series to series and do them all equally well. Um, this was a, this was a, a, a Ribe series, uh, referencing a Ribe uh, pottery, which I, I particularly liked. And uh, the, uh, some of those things are still available, I think. So actually, now he's, uh, through this whole process that I've been going through, he's, he's been writing books. And each book gets him more and more popular on the on the show circuit, and I would say that he's probably affected. If the, if there's a potter in here that has any kind of a ceramic library and doesn't have one of his books in there, um, I think it's it's short. Uh, and uh, so there's the, there's the, the number of books that he's written. He also produced a series of of uh, videos and DVDs that were very popular. But all along, every time he'd come home from a workshop, he would put the money that he earned into his garden. And they had, a, they have a, a five acre garden that is, um, bus tours come to see it. It's so beautiful and so magnificent. So now and about six or seven years ago, he, he, he couldn't he couldn't work anymore. He he he'd had um, physical problems that he couldn't make pots anymore. So he turned to doing these glaze paintings on uh, ceramic ceramic substrates, um, and I think they're they're really quite beautiful. And he he discovered that there's more money on the wall than on the table. Uh, you know, so these 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 were now paintings, and so they were fetching a lot more money than his pots were, and he. he and I think they were really quite successful. Again, beautiful glazes. So then, uh, two or three years ago, he was diagnosed with uh, with uh, liver cancer, and his and his and he got, got shaky hands, and he couldn't do those anymore either. He couldn't do the glaze paintings, so he took to the computer, and. Um, he, you know, this, the last uh, CD he did was called Swan Song, his Swan Song. He'd been telling me, he'd been asking me to do his eulogy at Ensica. I was supposed to do it in Kansas City. I was supposed to do it. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, geez. Uh, but anyways, his last thing was this, the Swan Song, which was, it was, he was planning his party. And, uh, and I think you guys have, have planned it perfectly with a, with a St. Patrick's Day a parade. Uh, but a month, uh, just a month before he died, he received Canada's highest award, which is the Governor General's Award. And that's, um, that's given uh, to recognize outstanding achievement in, in, the, in the arts, music, literary, whatever. And so that just came in a nick of time. And um, I think his family were, were really uh, proud of that moment. So, grass, they, they say the, 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 the grass is greener on the other side of the hill. Well, I don't know how it could have been any greener for that man. I mean, to live your life making things of, of, that are beautiful, to create a, a, a house and a home that's beautiful, 
uh, to make a, a really big state, big, big mark on the world uh, with your books and your writing and your teaching. That's a, that's a life well lived. Um, so, grass. Thank you.